My name is Paul Friedlander. I'm a kinetic light sculptor and scientific artist. My life has been inspired by scientific ideas, but it's been occupied by creating light art. And here we are in my studio in London, surrounded by some of my light art and uh, an empty space that is now filled, but still has a sense of openness to it. I'm always ready for the next thing to arrive. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Today we have a special guest, Paul Freelander. He is a uh, renowned new media artist, to be more exact, light artist, light sculptor. Can you introduce yourself a little bit, who you are, what you do? Hello, Mo. For me, it's a little bit strange even to be described as a new media artist, although, of course, this term has been around for a while now. But I know that when I first started creating art, there was already a lot of experiments in the air, and it was definitely experiments with media that fascinated me from the very outset. But that term didn't exist, and there was other movements. And so to really give a kind of overall background context, I'd really like to sort of start back in the really the first movement, very experimental, that I was attracted to was kinetic art. And kinetic art emerged at a time when all sorts of different kinds of experiments were going on, particularly its mechanical and practical nature appealed to me. And I had this feeling, ah, oh, this is something which I really love because I can see the, the sort of how it's done in some, in some way that was not just about the imagination, but it's also about the artist uh, using his imagination to apply himself with the techniques that he was working with. And I think about this time in history, there were also experiments which were very much about visual perception, things like op art. And the, more or less simultaneously, we had emerging a kind of this different media without even people talking about media as such. If you had asked people about that word to start with, we'd say, well, you know, Paint is a medium, stone is a medium, wood is a medium, and the word initially referred as much back to very traditional ancient materials. And yet in this transition phase, we were beginning to realize that film, electronic sound, these are actually the things that where people were noticing and becoming conscious of the newness of the media is what affected the artistic quality of the output. So suddenly people could create sounds they could create images or they could create dynamic changing forms, which would not have been possible without those new media. So the kind of term new media emerged somewhere along in history. I'm not quite even sure where. In the first place, the new media were there and people were playing with it in their different little or maybe not so little zones. I mean, some of these areas like the sound probably was huge from the outset once people started to realize they could create extraordinary sounds initially just with tape recorders i mean this, this, this is all the kind of very early history of how these ideas of experimenting with the technology uh, grabbed the imagination of myself and many other artists and this is a time which started i suppose even when i was a child and it was something that you know i I was aware of it. it was in the air. It was being talked over right from the, even before I was born. There were the very, very earliest experiments by people like Nam Garbum, Leslie Mahali, Nam yeah. Like Tingerly. And Tingly, exactly. So all of these things were kind of here and there. And it wasn't as though there was suddenly a day when it became in fashion and exactly in 1960. But somehow through the 60s, and it became a center of attention and all these different media were beginning to be uh, seen as something for a very like, working away from what you could do using traditional media and adding to the art potential in a way that we'd never seen before. And it was that that was like the key thing that triggered me off. And in, in particular, I remember going to this great exhibition of kinetic art in 1970. And that was it. In a single day, I went from being this maybe not exactly the perfect science student. I was studying physics at the time. I had a background loving science. And all my youth, I had been both a kind of influenced by the culture of the 60s, but still more influenced by science than anything else. And in that single day, everything changed. And I said to myself, no, I, I don't want to give up my interest in art and science, but I can see that my true calling it's, it's got to be somewhere else and, and that, that that was the move that shifted me away from um being a, 
a potential cosmologist or failed cosmologist or we'll never know, you know, because I just I switched track. Potential Nobel Prize winner, because you were studying under the tutor, no, Sir Anthony Leggett, who later won Nobel Prize. So you could have won Nobel Prize. <laughs> Tony was a brilliant tutor, and he was very, very inspiring to all his students and incredibly generous with his time. So, yes, I am incredibly lucky in that sense. Tony had, <sighs> I don't know, because I don't know other Nobel laureates to compare it with, but he had a passion about teaching, which would really singled him out as a great person quite apart from his, uh, his deep in, in fascinating uh, insights, which he later developed that gave him the prize, he inspired us to all think about the foundations of physics in a way that I found absolutely intriguing. And those questions are, I, I know that even all these, you know, two generations later are still the kind of the area where there's the greatest mystery applies. And when people start talking about quantum mechanics, there's a danger it all becomes a great waffle, but there's a reality that for those at least who've understood enough, that these are still the cutting edge uh, enigmas that, that drive forward uh, some kind of research projects, which would like to, to seek more in that area. And I, I, for one, have never lost a fascination with following that material. So I'm very happy that I had that youthful kind of um, motivation given to me. Do you think that your background in physics actually helped you, like without your previous studies, do you think you would be, let's say, able to make the same kind of work, achieve same kind of uh, achievements? Or? Almost certainly not. And I feel that, that this works at two different levels. Uh, the first level is just the ideas. And in a sense, the ideas that I take from physics and not even physics, they're much more deep still. It's about mathematics and about form. And I don't claim to be a great mathematician. In fact, that was one of my frustrations was that I wasn't better at this damn stuff. You have to be so brilliant at it. But I was excited by it. And the ideas that we take at a philosophic level are about concepts of waves and particles. And I loved waves from the outset. There was something intrinsically magic about thinking about waveforms and also graceful and also elegant and also fascinating because they're so informationally rich. Even though I didn't even see it at the time, and it, only many years later it kind of crept into my work and my work became, as it were, an expression of, of waves rather than an expression with waves. And after all, you know, we're talking, we're using waves, sound waves, and there's so much that's in one way or another a waveform, but to recognize that as a kind of central thing was something I definitely feel like emerged from that early learning. And then at a practical level, of course, it, it's useful that I did at least grasp enough math and enough uh, skills as a computer programmer that later on I could imply that to be able to organize my work and program, which um, is something that a lot of people take for granted now because it's become universal. But Initially, when I first started out, it was a it was a kind of niche area that was only a very few artists who had you know, access to the special new media centers, and nobody else really had it because there was no personal computers yet. But I at least had dabbled a little bit, and I remember the first time I ever started to make art with a computer. It was on some special short little course at my art college, the Exeter Art college didn't have a computer. Goodness me, no, you know, these were exotic things, but I got an uh, opportunity to go up to Imperial College in London and just spend a few days being introduced to the rudiments of what was then possible using ASCII code. And you were just printing out patterns of noughts and ones or crosses and blank spaces or anything you wanted to do, but it had to be just that and nothing more. That's all the technology allowed. But immediately I was hooked. I just loved this. And, and, and uh, there was a kind of fascination for being able to use algorithms to generate pattern and order uh, and all of that. It was sort of um, something that's just kind of beginning to emerge and would later be recognized as a, as a great media. But at that time, it was just, 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 just toys, really. You know, even when I was young, I remembered going into a computer room. It was actually a room of a computer. And you have to... Uh, change into a uh, you know dust free clothing and be very careful approaching this machine and it was like such a majestic creature and now we have one you know we have like our phone that is probably you know stronger and better than any computer in the 90s 
And yes, we have gone so far, but back in your days when you first started, there was practically no money. How did you make your first money? There's a question. I have to confess that both there was a sense of potential doom that it would never be possible. <laughs> and combined with that, a certain persistence. So initially, I didn't think it was possible. I was more or less certain it couldn't be done. So my guess was, when I left college, that the best I could do to avoid getting kind of contaminated by the world at large was to take on other work closely related to a, a true art subject matter, but as close as possible. And two things really uh, struck me at the time. A, that I'd also much enjoyed the light shows that I'd seen in the 60s, and there was the, already a large commercial world, people doing stage lighting equipment. So I tried to kind of sell myself as an inventor of uh, devices for entertainment. And I don't think that was a very successful move in terms of a career move, because you're kind of debasing yourself if you do that a little bit. And it was a little bit successful in terms of, well, it did bring some money and some interest in. But at the same time, I also was invited just to start thinking about stage design as a challenge from the design end. So I wasn't necessarily going to be designing or inventing any new techniques, but I was just going to be seeing what I could do with traditional lighting equipment you know, in the context of having a, a space to work with, which is a theatric space or, or a concert space. And that I found really inspiring because suddenly um, I was given permission or rather the authority over, right? You know, you go off and you organize this. So as a young man suddenly being presented with some major challenge, walking into a large semi-derelict venue and being told, okay, we need the space to be lit. That I think in a way has had another huge influence on me. I never gave up that love of the, of the big scale, the spectacle, and nor did I ever worry about the fact that it's all transient, that whereas you know, art in the past, you tend to think in terms of if you're literally carving in stone or painting in oil, it's something that will last for centuries. But if you're designing for the stage, maybe done in a week or a month. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hello. You've worked part time in the light shows, in the theaters. And then later on, um, what is your biggest breakthrough in your career as an artist? Okay, so at some point in the mid 80s, these waves that just so fascinated me as a concept suddenly popped into existence in a way I, I wasn't anticipating. And it was a beautiful example of serendipity at work where you know, the world just seemed to give me something I, I hadn't anticipated. I was at the time thinking about how to create new kinds of light sculpture in the sense that I didn't just want to be projecting onto flat screens. I didn't want to just be designing for static or even mechanically moved objects because all of those still felt like they weren't, they weren't dealing with energy and flow and those kind of fundamental things that obviously fascinated me. And when you listen to music, sometimes in your imagination, at least in my imagination, it all becomes like these kind of flowing qualities that are just there and, and changing in our, ways that we're now familiar with through digital animation. But at that point, very few people were doing that. And I was just thinking, trying to find some way to actually bring into existence in the physical world some sense of this energy. But, uh, but it wasn't something that could be done using you know, special glasses and stereo projection, because then you're still looking at something that's sort of hidden in a little magic window. I wanted it to be actually somewhere, something present in this space, something that you shared the space with in the same way that sculpture is just something you, you could live with it potentially. And in, in amongst all the little experiments I was doing, one day I thought to myself, a jump rope or a skipping rope, as we'd say in English, that makes this kind of volume of space in air when you skip. It surrounds the, the skipper. What about if you just use that as a projection surface? And as soon as I built a little miniature uh, device with just a couple of toy motors and set a piece of string spinning, it didn't just make a simple lemon-shaped volume as you could skip it. It made all these elaborate, complex waveforms. And then 
that was it. That that was like one of those amazing aha moments that one only has now and again. And I said, wow. And this also fitted in because in the early 90s, there was much talk about chaos theory and the mathematical ideas that underpin how when you start out with a very simple system, sometimes it behaves in a simple way and other times it definitely does not. So this is a perfect uh, physical example of how you can get this emergent complexity. And that then started me off on a, a path with, initially it was very small. I was just working on this small scale and then gradually over a period of years through the 90s, this then developed into something that's become so you know, characteristic of much of what I've, ever, I've done ever since. Today, if you are a new artist starting your career all over again, would you have done differently or would you still do what exactly you did with the light sculptures and ropes? What I find exciting is that even though I discovered all this stuff about 30 years ago, in a way, I'm still filling in a space that needs more material in it. Because in all that time, there's been so much talk about holograms, for example, and yet when you go and see it, a so-called hologram, you know, recreating a, a dead pop musician or whatever it is that you choose to go and see, you realize that there are actually some pretty basic tricks are being used to give you the impression that you're seeing something that isn't still truly a 3D light sculpture in the way that I dreamed of doing. And so I would definitely still be asking that same question, that is how can I kind of ingeniously find ways to do something that is occupying space, but is doing it in a way that's not what, it, not what anybody else is doing right now. And, uh, uh, of course, I, if I knew another trick that was different completely, then I'd, I'd be doing it already. And uh, so, but maybe somebody else will come along with something. And I think that's the most fascinating thing that we can sort of, if we're smart at it, we can sit down and create all this stuff that exists in a virtual world. But what fascinates me is to kind of pull things out of the virtual world and bring them into to our our space and and that that would be the question i'd be asking myself because i know that virtual world is so rich and so inspiring but it's still a little bit frustrating because you're always kind of caught inside the frame you're always just looking at your your phone or looking at the big screen multi screen projection wherever it is whether it's small or large it's still kind of inside that virtual space and and that, so what for me is the great excitement is, is to kind of room to really bring the stuff, to, to share the space with it. So who you work with? Do you work with the museums or the galleries or the projects or light shows or like who are your clients? Let's just put it in a commercial way. Okay. So I have had considerable uh, ex uh, excellent interest from science centers and they have been one of some, some of my best clients. And the science centers are in a position to commission large scale works. And they're in a position to support them once they're there, because as, um, as a large piece of kinetic art, then there's a technical um, maintenance issue, which is maybe not something that suits everybody or every situation. And I, I'm aware that it's a challenge for every artist to think where he's going to present his, put his work, but this is an extra challenge, it's an extra layer. So Science Centers pr produce, you know, have provided me with a, an opportunity to, to sell in a way that I, I can't um, with confidence to everybody else because how they're going to look after that piece for a very long time, uh, I can't be there to help everybody. Uh, but the Science Centers have the, the know-how on board to do it. With the galleries, I sold a little bit, but I've never really connected on a large scale with the gallery world, and I've ever, I've never sold on a regular basis into galleries. Most of my other projects are still short term, and uh, very much this is that kind of goes beyond where we were talking about before about stage lighting. That when I've been invited to go and do a festival, and that festival might be might be just for a few days, or it might be for months. But in every situation, the first thing I want to know is where exactly, you know, show me the venue. And then I will start to think in particular detail inspired from the venue, whether I can come up with something which is a new and will then be kind of become a site specific installation that's created. 
not so much in partnership with the festival, although it is a partnership with the festival, but with the with the particular opportunity they give me. So it's the challenge of working in in different spaces that I find fascinating. And those are the, um, the two major areas of, of my clients in the past, a lot of science centers work have been ongoing and, and more and more so on these temporary installations. And I love that it's temporary. It doesn't um, seem wrong that it's temporary. I, I accept that it's transient. And I, I see the future for those works is just to be able to, to record and preserve a, a document about it in such a way that it gives you a richer and richer sense of what it's like to be there. You just mentioned uh, art festivals, and here I would like to give a special thanks to Moncho, the director and founder of uh, Art Futura. He actually put us together. We never met in person, although we could. I was visiting London, but by then I didn't know you were London-based, and uh, uh, we just uh, been presented and uh, connected by Moncho, so special thanks to Art Futura, one of the uh, first and one of the most influential uh, new media art festivals in the world. So can you tell me a little bit about how did you get in touch with them and how did you start working with them and did they really help you get better known in the industry or you know what other perks and benefits of working with a festival? Well, I would say there's no doubt that this, possibly the single biggest kind of step up that happened in my life was as a result of, in the first place, going to Barcelona to do a very small gig in a very small uh, festival organized by a group of VJs. And this was, I think, in the year 2000 or 1999. And then while I was at that festival, um, Monzo came to see what was going on and immediately invited me to return. And um, so then I came back and did a much bigger installation shortly afterwards in Barcelona. And that really kicked things off in a way that there's never been any other so obvious step change. It was a really lovely experience. And I have to really thank Moncha for that because he encouraged me in a way that one needs that kind of the particular opportunity given to an artist because he could see that what I was doing was unusual and interesting. But it, but he also could see that it had a potential to grow given the right space to be in. So um, there was this a festival in 2000 in, in a place in Barcelona called the CCCB. And that was really the moment when I sort of got known in Spain and in the following years, um, not just Art Futura, but various other organizations took me up and I suddenly found I was having a series of invitations and perhaps more than any, I was going back to Spain. So while well, uh, here in England, I was still relatively unknown. In Spain, I was getting shown in different cities around. So that was a really fantastic moment. Thank you, Monta. And if an artist wanted to start his or her career today, what would be the obvious choice? What would they do? They first go to an institution and say, hey, I want you to commission me a project. Or they would pitch themselves into an art festival. Or what are the next steps? Well, everybody's different. So I'm not going to tell everybody else how to do it. And I guess some people are more business-like than others or more persistent. So they, they could see how they could go and talk the talk and find their feet in a different situations. But in the first place, what everybody's got to do is to find something that they feel right about. So if they you know, have, the, you know, have a, a gut reaction, this is the way to go, whether it's they've got some personal discovery they want to pursue or some personal fascination for some particular field that turns them on, whether it's music, films, new media, pure and simple without, well, not simple is not the word, but pure, but without any connections. I mean, all these different uh, areas, you have to find what, what draws you into it. And I, uh, that's it. You know, it's all about that kind of finding the personal magnet inside yourself that says, right, I'm going to put my energy in here uh, uh, and see what I can do with it. And what are the best qualities an, an artist like in your field could obtain or could train themselves into? I guess the main thing beyond the, having the talent in the first place and the inclination is persistence. You've got to be patient. You've just got to just keep with it. And even if you don't get anywhere to start with or you don't feel like you're happy what you're doing is good enough, you just keep keep doing it, keep trying. and. 
if you're persistent enough, that's the probably the key thing to everything else that's going to follow next. If you're not persistent, then, well, you know. <laughs> this is where I, I feel like I, I'm not the great wise man to tell you what to do. I, I can only just tell you what won't work. And it's having those brilliant ideas, knowing because somebody coming up with a thought about, OK, I'm going to go and say this to this person and that will make them go, wow, that's amazing. I mean, yeah, if you can have those kind of uh, inspirational moments that you can just inspire somebody else, then, of course, they'll take you on, take you up and go with it. So come up with the amazing idea. Think of the right person to talk to it about. If you could go back in time, what would you have done differently at what moment? Mm, that's a hard one to just jump into it there. I, I believe the best way is always just to move on and, and not dwell on your regrets. So I'm going to have to sort of you know, scratch my head and think, <laughs> what were the bad moments which I chose to forget about? And I guess the biggest regret that jumps up onto the list that's long since stopped bothering me but I do know that at the end of the time I was in, first I studied physics at university and then I did fine art in an art college. And my biggest regret came at the end of the art college when I realized I was not cutting it within the context of the fine art world as it was then, or maybe is still now, that there was some kind of perception that, yes, this Paul Friedlander, obviously he works hard and he's doing some stuff, but we're not really sure it suits what we are looking for. For. And if the regret is how do you get through when you seem to be dealing with this sort of intangible barrier of we just don't approve of what you're doing, even if you're really trying hard to do it. And that was very frustrating for me in the immediate period after I graduated, knowing that I hadn't been sort of picked as the top draw person to be immediately pushed into the, the top lane of whatever it is that then makes people become, it makes it an easier ride to become a famous artist. And that was pretty frustrating. And I, I feel that if one goes through a moment like that or a period of time like that, that could be the, exactly the sort of thing that makes you lose persistence. So that, yeah, that was the hardest thing I went through in my whole uh, career was having to put up with the sense that, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll graduate. We're not going to kick you out, but we're not going to sort of mark you with a double star and say you're a great student. And it was a war of different attitudes. My personal tutor might have thought it was, I was good, but he didn't have enough oomph to push the matter. So, <laughs> so come and say hi to Mo briefly, Karina, and then. Uh... Hello. Hi. <laughs> I mean, you just mentioned a typical thing that would happen to every fine art student's life, and that's like for them, if they choose to, you know, continue go down the fine art road, that is their reality every single day until they make it, the frustration, the disapproval, the gatekeeping, the elitism, everything is there every day. It is very, very hostile. The art world is not a welcoming world. It's not. And I, and I have a, a strong sense, having come from this background of studying physics, and also, I should mention, my father was a mathematician, so I was, you know, my mother was an artist. I'm, in a sense, I'm a perfect blend. I was gifted in that sense, but I was also aware of the fact that he was an utterly brilliant mathematician. I was a competent one. And there is a sense that in the sciences, there is a real objective way that can, people can be graded. And, and when you sit down to do those exams, it's a fair process that sorts people out. And yeah, I can get a good mark, but I couldn't get the extraordinary mark. And it's fair enough. I couldn't get it. So I couldn't, I'm not sort of the worthy material to be immediately to be picked out. But with the art, there isn't the same kind of sense of objectivity that there is a way to say, okay, do this stuff, prove it, and then we'll, we'll let you in. On the contrary, there is no objective criteria. It's very much, and it's not just about taste, it's a very much a complex cultural equation that's being played out all the time. Certain people who've gained the power, who act like aristocrats, like kings, that they, uh, they, it's their arbitrary decision eventually as to what is, uh, is, is what they feel is the right thing to be pursuing at this moment. And then they will just pick and choose. And I did feel very frustrated by that. It was tough and not something that 
um, remotely feels fair. Whereas with the hard exams, you feel it's fair. If it didn't come top of the exam, well, that's it. You know, uh, so there's a there's a definite sense with art, but it, it, it's you'll never you'll never to, to play the you know the system's never fair in that way. You know? And you're never good enough. And it's how ironic you were studying under a Nobel Prize winning professor in physics, one of the toughest domain, and you were good enough there. But when you go to the art world, they would just say, "Oh no, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. Don't do that. Don't do that." It's a.、Uh, it's very hard to to know if this is the right thing for you to do or not when you study at the art school. So when I ask people like, "What is the most traumatic experience in your life?" and I would say the majority of the art school graduate would say, "Ah,、oh, having gone to art school." <laughs> <laughs> and not so unusual response in that sense. Yeah. And、uh, would you actually recommend artists going to? Because you have gone to、um, a science study, you have gone to art study. What would you recommend if someone want to be a, a new media artist? I, I, I think they need to learn the media. They need the the the, the technical and the engineering knowledge, and in a sense, that is a very frustration about. The way that traditionally art is taught is good, but we don't want to learn traditional art. So, if you had the ambition to be able to draw like Leonardo, and you wanted to go to a kind of old-style art school and learn to draw brilliantly, then it would be fine to be in art school because then you would have a, an objective criteria by which you could judge yourself and by which you could discuss your progress with your tutors. As soon as you want to do something which is an undefinable thing, you want to be imaginative and inventive. Then art school is—it's it, not really—it doesn't itself know where it's where it's trying to lead its students, and it's not necessarily very helpful. So, if you are going to go to a, a school, what you've really got to understand is what are their focuses, what are they, what can they offer me, and so you might turn out you're better off doing a, a, a computer programming. Um, degree or an electronic engineering degree or some other kind of technical degree in biology or some other field, because that will then give you the insights about how to work with systems, which then you could apply in a way that、uh, was artistic rather than、um, a, a straightforward application that was something that was going to become a technology. What do you think about working part time as a new media artist? Because I've got a couple friends. They're working, for example, in engineering, e-commerce, IT, and they want to move into the new media space to become an artist. But they are not sure. They don't want to quit their jobs yet. They want to, you know, get trained a little bit on the weekends and experiment、uh, during their holidays. I mean, in my opinion, it's a,、uh, you know, you, it's not. Enough to just spend the weekends, especially you have a busy, demanding job, and if you have family, that's even like worse timing. You know, juggling so many balls, wearing so many hats. It, obviously, it worked out for you because you had a job, you know, in the theater, working as a light designer. What is your recommendation? Well, <laughs> again, like I don't want to pretend to be the. The expert on careers, even if I look like the wise old man, I, it's just my life. I led it, and that's the way it worked out. It, a lot depends upon people's energy levels. Again, some people just have so much energy, and and good for them. And maybe they can do this, you know, juggling the many balls and keeping all the different things going. It's all about finding energy, then. But I mean, talking about human energy, not 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 some physics energy. You just need to really just be able to keep keep it up and.、Uh, If I have any other regrets, is that I don't have more energy. <laughs> so I would say that,、um, of course, you just got to do whatever you've got to do. And if you can't make, you know, make money out of art initially, then you're inevitably you're going to have to to juggle those balls. You're going to have to take a job, uh, uh, but try and take an interesting job which is somehow closely connected to what you want to do, because maybe you can borrow the equipment of your you know, workplace, or you know, you can somehow get inspiration from that workplace. Uh, and that will so it will kind of connect over to your artistic activities, and it's not just you're having to work in a a diner or some other you know low grade job just because you're desperate, but try and still be ambitious in some other way and pursue 
an interesting workspace and at the same time don't give off on the art activity. And earlier you mentioned one word, talents, and I was wondering in the back of my head, like, how did you know that you actually had the talent? Now that I know that your parents are working in the physics and the, working in the art, of course, you had the born talent genetically, and you had also the confidence, you know that you've got the talents. But for someone who came from a non-artistic family, without knowing either the technical side of new media or the artistic side, how do they know that they have talents? Do they have to run some sort of self-diagnose or... Because there are many people say, I want to be a new media artist. And I look at them and I was like, what do you do? I'm an IT technician. Okay, keep your day job. <laughs> you make more money this way. You're happier this way. I mean, they, it's not for everyone. No, I guess that's probably true. And of course, ultimately, you can only be a judge of yourself. And the tendency to judge yourself harshly is potentially could do you a lot of damage. You've really got to try and be kind to yourself and nurture whatever it is that you, you maybe feel it's just like a hobby. I would have been shy to even describe myself as an artist as a young person. I, I, I felt that would have been pretentious. And it was just like a hobby to start with. And there, there was a, a phase when whatever encouragement I might have had through having that lucky, uh, culturally rich um, childhood, it's still, there's, there's going to be that gradual gaining of confidence. And, and you've just got to say, well, maybe it is only a hobby, but heck, I want to do it. And I'm going to just see where it takes me. And uh, so it's to kind of grow, to grow that confidence in your talent. It's not going to happen. Something just happens instantly. Some people are kind of pushed into it from youth, like the parents who send their children to learn music and they become classical musicians or something like that. But if you're doing new media, of course, there is no kind of reliable precursor. So you, you know, there's going to be a, a phase of uncertainty where you don't really know whether you're just messing around or playing at it or if this might really go somewhere. So you just got to, again, it's all about persistence. So say, well, I don't really know if it's going anywhere, but I'm just going to do it anyway and see. You know, maybe it'll bring me more, more joy than I can possibly guess right now. The word joy, yes, yes. A lot of uh, the motivation of uh, artists for their creation is, you know, creating gives me joy. So that's why I'm doing it. But then that's like a hobby. You know, for example, I love eating ice creams, but I'm not getting paid eating ice creams because that's like, I take the pleasure. Why other people should, you know, sacrifice their money to make me enjoy my life, right? So you're also kind of, you're also obligated to give something in return to others in exchange of their attention, of their support, of their money. So do you have some sort of the added value in your art that you're giving to the society? Let's say, you know, I, I'm here today. I deserve it because I gave this, this and that to the society. I believe that something I didn't even notice at all or realize when I was young, but again, it just be some, became something that became thematically. People just would keep telling me over and over later, the artist is an inspiration to others because when they see that energy that you've been nurturing and growing inside and they see your enthusiasm for what you do, that's an inspiration to everybody. And so what you're giving back is your personal energy, you're giving back this sense of your purpose, of your commitment, of your belief in yourself. And that is inspiring for other people who are, everybody's struggling with a belief in themselves. But if you keep struggling with it year after year, you build this power and then it shines out. And after a while, that that is perhaps a, in a way as valuable a gift as any art you create is that when you meet artists, you know they're different from just anybody else on the street. They're They've, they've committed themselves and they've got this energy about them, which is just you know, something in itself. I can see that your miniature light sculptures, they're very, I don't want to be offensive, but they're very like commercializable. Like they're super, you know, catchy and we could totally produce like tens of thousands of them in China and sell them around the world. Like, would you like this idea? Do you think from a professional point of view, 
um, that would give you some perks of, let's say, getting um, known better by the common people to really have accessing a, a larger market? Or do you think that's damage to your current career reputation because you have institutional clients? Um, have you done any commercialization? Why and why not? I tried commercialization in my early days. That, 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 and since then, I've probably almost phobically kept away from it. And so, yeah, I, these are available in limited editions. I'm happy to see them produced in limited editions. I don't see that there's any benefit in offering them out by the thousand. I don't believe there is the... I mean, I'm wrong, but maybe, maybe it, it could be that, in fact, it does would make sense to offer it on a larger scale. I'm mostly concerned that commercializing can damage because the people who make the decisions are the wrong people. And it's exactly the same story you've heard a million times over and over. There's always going to be that battle. Is he just doing it to sell records or to sell prints or whatever? And sell prints is hardly a big deal in the way selling music has. But I could see it could be the same story. Or is it going to be because the artist needs to do that to express themselves? So the artist needs to stay in charge. We've got to be the ones in the steering wheel. The first big project you did with a client in the making of the project, I know it's a long time ago, but you know, I would imagine that you were uh, just uh, uh, working the river by touching the rocks. That's a Chinese mm. expression, right? Like just basically testing the water and trying to, you know, go and learn as you go. Um, what were the actual some areas that you didn't know before? Nobody taught you. The art school didn't teach you. I, I guess I was lucky that I would started dealing with science centers first because they themselves are not commercial institutions. They're not there for profit. They're usually funded wholly by the state. At the same time, they are proper institutions. So when it came to the day when I got a big commission from Science Center in Switzerland, the Technorama, they had a proper contract, lots of detail that I had to read through and figure out. But they already understood and granted me those rights. And then through a process of getting involved from that kind of commercially friendly end, because they weren't hostilely trying to trick me into anything. I understood what a fair agreement would look like. And then so when later on I looked at what was asked of me, I always had that as my kind of first benchmark. And then I remember also when I did go into trying to sell mass-produced items and we were seeking to get a, a license and, and to patent my ideas, I had a lot of advice from a guy who himself felt really hurt because he had his ideas stolen and he you know, found himself in the situation where he was stuck in the middle that he'd invented something and science centers would still come to him for the, the superb high quality um, versions, but there were mass produced ones out there by the thousand that he had no control over anymore. And so I learned from him a great deal about how to be super careful. So yeah, you need to you know get the steps right in the first place. And and I was I so I was lucky in that sense. It was just pure chance that my first big uh, contract was with a non-commercial client, and then subsequently, when I did try and do commercial things, I had some really good advice, and it worked very well for me. What gave you the credibility and access to the institutions that you mentioned? You know, state-owned, fair contracts. I mean, not every artist walking into their doors or would be allowed to walk into their doors, would get this deal. How do they access this institutions? Well, I'm sure in my case, it came back down to the fact that I had something original to offer. And it's having that original thing to offer. It's just like the singer who can sing an amazing song and you've just never heard anything like it before. That sets you on the path. All the rest of it, I just have to thank my lucky stars that it worked out for me. and. I don't know how it would work out today in another situation. Of course, there should be places people can go and find this information, and maybe your channel or elsewhere, there, there are resources now where it's much easier online to, to teach yourself. Every artist has to become a business person as well, and it's something that we just have to pick up along the way. And I've never thought of myself as a business person in the slightest. I 
I hate the whole idea, but somehow it, it happens anyhow that you have to at least develop some basic li literacy. That's like to, learning to talk. You know, you know, without that, you, you would be in danger. Yeah. Maybe not every artist, but I would say the majority of the artists would think their ideas are very original. How do you know if your idea is, is noble? A, you've got to just trust your guts and, and have faith in yourself, like we were saying before. But B, uh, go out there and test yourself. Make sure you, you find somewhere, get invited to, or just ask if you can go. Go and attend some conference and just plead. Can I just have 15 minutes when I can give some little uh, talk and present my ideas to at least some subset of that gang of people who are attending there? So a few experts, maybe they'll criticize you very harshly. Maybe they'll ignore you. But if you're really lucky, maybe at least one of them will take a lot of interest in it, and then that will get things you know, things moving for you at another level. It's no longer just your per personal dream. You've now got some, some connections. So that's that's got to be. You've got to find somewhere, some stage, which is, even if it's a modest scale that you start out, the tiniest little project, but you've got to find the potential peers, the the, the who you're presenting it to. It can't just be the general public. It's got to be other people who have knowledge of the field because then they will understand whether it's truly original. They will know whether they say, oh, sorry, that was already done 10 years ago, 300 years ago, whatever. Or they will say, no, we like that. That you know, It may be a bit like something else, but it's, it's new. So, yeah, we dig it. What you described is very similar to what happens in the academic world, right? You have double-blind peer review, you have conference, you have all of the systems to help you identify, verify, you know, to improve, to update. But in the art world, you have basically just the critiques that you usually access as an art student, but otherwise you don't have any other means or ways to share this with the world. There isn't really a channel to get this otherwise. It is very good. We can meet and it, online, and it's very good. We can put this content up there, but it's not going to be the same as actually meeting people in the flesh. So I'm sure there's always going to be a need to be prepared to travel and to go, you know, however far it takes, to some place where it's all gathering, where the people who are the, 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 the interested parties are gathering. So it, it's up to you to find where there is somewhere you'd like to go, some festival, some conference, where there's going to be a gathering of, of like minds uh, and, and somehow get yourself through that door. And, and uh, yeah, that, I, I, I think that's the only way when you actually meet people that then potentially you make those stronger connections. As I say earlier in the conversation, I, you know, I went through initial youthful enthusiasm was one aha moment in my life. I went through that moment when there's this great revelation. I discovered something was totally fascinating and new. But that in itself didn't make me famous. And then I had to go and present it somewhere. But even that only just kind of opened some further doors. And then further down the line, I met Moncho. And it's like all the time you're just trying to, to find more connections and just find some way to actually physically put yourself in contact with the rest of the world. And, and, and in this modern age, you might say, perhaps we can just do that all online. And maybe it's true. We can truly build an online community that does that. But if it's going to be thousands and thousands of members, there's always going to have to be kind of subgroups. There's going to have to be just like tight knit little organizations because you can't be friends with thousands of people, even if you proudly have a thousand Facebook friends, but it's meaningless. You don't actually know who these people are. It's only going to be that small minority of people you take the trouble to stay close to, who you're going to learn from, who may be able to help you uh, and who, from, who are going to take inspiration from. So it's got to be this kind of um, much closer, in, either in body, in person, or, or in terms of how we, how we all connect with each other. Exactly. That's how I also find it's very hard to get this connection, to talk to the people that who will understand what your struggles are. That's why we started a, uh, an online community, a small group, 
and we have a Patreon page. The people can donate from you know one euro to join, and then every month we organize uh, our uh, monthly talks. We just get in touch with each other over Zoom call, and we just discuss what happened last month or you have new projects and you can present your project to each other and say like I would like to work with someone else you know who is interested or write an article together or you know even physically meet so that's also what we are trying to do and uh, here I want to give a special thanks to our lovely patrons in the community and I will leave a link in the description below if you want to check it out so do you have a community tell us about I am a member of an organization called Flux Events, which is an, an organization specifically set up for new media artists. And it's currently, it's two directors, Oliver Gingrich and Marina Amani. They have hosted many actual live events where we've met, and I, I really enjoyed the meetings. Lately, we haven't had so many meetings, but they're continuing to be busy organizing some different things, sometimes in collaboration with the National Gallery. So they're there and by now several thousand associate members. That's an interesting organization. I encourage people to encourage them as well because we're struggling to keep the energy up because I know everybody's busy running their own lives and keeping an organization together like this requires a lot of energy as well. So I've felt it coming and going in sort of surges of how much activity has been going on within that. Okay, so here we are. Then I just take it for a little walk around my studio. It's um, this wall here is where all the, the little pieces are that we've been in the background up until now. They're made out of acrylic and they're edge lit, so they're concealed in the bases of them as a, a strip of LEDs. And then the light flows up through the acrylic. And I have the technology in house here to fabricate all of these because um, these are a laser cutter, a laser cutter engraver machine. So there's the tech to actually build it. But a lot of these ideas, they do start actually with the waves. I mean, it's all still about waves. I wrote a program to generate waves. Like in physics, you have this idea of waves interfering with each other, but interference is actually not a bad thing. It's a very elegant thing. It's the idea of how when waves interact, they kind of play with each other in very distinctive mathematical ways. And I thought, well, oh, heck, this isn't that difficult. It doesn't require AI. This is actually classical programming in a sense. So I sat down and I, I sat up all the equations for wave motion in a virtual world. And I can make all this stuff move on screen and do very pretty changing things. But then I decided I would also just kind of do screen captures. And then from the screen captures, I could then generate um, a file that the, com that the computer could then send over to my laser cutter, which I have down in the basement. So I'm well equipped. So you make everything yourself by hand? Well, in a sense, yes. Obviously, I mean, I'm using uh, a, a computer-controlled machine down there in the basin, but it is a sort of it's made by hand. I start out with the equations. I turn them into a computer program. The computer program generates the output that can then be uh, fabricated. And this is, um, yeah, a nice collection of the little ones. I mean, there's some bigger ones as well, but I haven't got them out here because this is just like what's convenient to have around the studio without it totally taking over a couple of slightly bigger ones there there's an awful lot of reflection off the afternoon sunlight and i could probably just also just get the sort of grand view of it if i just use the mirror because there's a big mirror on the other side of the lovely yeah. Yeah. lovely yeah i'll see you soon all right then <laughs> bye bye